information continues to come fast and furious around the spread of the uh, coronavirus. But also, the central bankers are telling us what they're doing. Things are changing, and they may well be telling us about the reset that they have in mind for us. We're going to talk about all of this and so much more today. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in strategies and plans to help you survive and thrive the crisis that, as we all know now, is definitely unfolding. I'm going to start with some viewer questions because apparently a lot of you have asked these and so I want to address that quickly to begin with. And by the way, you know, if, if I say anything during this time that you don't fully understand, just let me know because it's important that you understand what's happening. So first I'm going to clarify what should be liquidated first. And I have to tell you, you must do whatever it is that you are comfortable with regardless of what anybody says. But for me, I would probably look at the annuities first. And in the annuities, if they are a variable annuity, that means that they are tied to the stock market. If they are an indexed annuity, like some that I've seen that just make me shake my head. I hope nobody that's listening to this has any of that where they create the index and then they tie the annuity to it. So I would say that you might want to look at your annuities first. Then I would also take a look at your money market positions and try and, and you know, I mean, I don't own any annuities. I don't own any money markets and I don't own any CDs because I have chosen not to loan those guys my wealth. So I don't own any of that. And I would say in light of everything that's happening that you should liquidate all of them. But if you want to know a first, second, and third, I'd probably go annuities first. Mm, and then it's kind of a toss up between the CDs and the money markets. You know, yes, the central banks are continuing to flood the repo market to keep the money markets kind of functioning. But let me tell you, we are getting hit with so many bombshells right now, I wouldn't trust any of it. So that's me. And then the other question is, if I have money in treasury bills, why would I want gold or silver coins when we live in the most powerful country in the world? Because the central banks keep telling you that they want to generate more inflation, which means that the dollar in this country, but wherever you are, the euro, the yen, the pound, etc., they all are calling for more inflation, and that means that they're telling you the currency is overvalued, and they are taking it down. So if you're in a treasury bill or any other sovereign bond, even if your perception is it is the strongest, most powerful country in the world, the goal is to rob you of your purchasing power through inflation. So that's why you need gold and you need silver so that you always hold your purchasing power. Right now, that's even short term, for goodness sakes. So that's why, forget it, I don't own any treasury bills either. Also, why would I choose coins over bars? Premiums are higher on coins and the content values are the same. Because a bar is a monetary gold. And history, even, even recent history, shows us that the most likely outcome is that the governments are going to confiscate the gold from us. Maybe they will, 
Maybe they won't. History tells us they will. But this is classified as a collectible. And the premiums, while they are a little bit bigger than they are on bars, you, that's your cost of insurance. They're still, we're still looking at coins with the lowest level of premiums that I've seen. And I've been in this industry for quite some time. And I think you can talk to anybody and they're saying the same thing. So is there a premium in there? Yes, that's your cost of insurance. Because I'd rather make sure that I actually have it, hold it in a form that I can use it wherever I am in the normal marketplace, because inside a crisis, there's always opportunities. So this is my dry powder. That's my dry powder to take advantage of the opportunities when they arise. So um, I, it's gonna be a little disjointed, so forgive me because I'm just grabbing data as much as I possibly can as it's coming out. And this was this morning, oh, well, that's wrong. This was actually this morning. And major averages, they're talking about being 15 below. So we're going to take a look at how low can these markets go? What a key thing. But definitely right now, coronavirus is front and center in everybody's consciousness. It definitely usurped the trade wars and even the recession, although, you know, somehow, even though Basically, the global economy is almost at a, at a, it is at a complete stand still in some places. They don't see any evidence of a recession. Well, the inverted yield curve on December 12th, 4th of 2018, uh, yeah, 2018, told us that the recession was coming. We, we're, what can I tell you? That's the data, and I believe it. No doubt about it. And so in the meantime, even with the volatility in the markets, and even with Wall Street's version of gold, here you're looking at the ETF GLD. On a short-term basis, this is still outperforming stocks, even though they're having to sell, not GLD, but some entities are having to sell gold contracts to meet margin calls. Gold is still holding up, better than anything else. The difference between GLD and this is GLD is a contract. You do not have access to the underlying physical. This, you hold it down, own outright. No counterparty risk, and it's the real thing. It, it just is that simple. So this morning, and I know I'm going fast, but there's a lot of material to cover. The world, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, finally declares the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic. Well, you know, there are a lot of people that said, well, why didn't they do that before? Well, what they were hoping for was more action by governments. But let's face it, they don't really act very quickly, typically. So, uh, the, and there is also uh, on CNBC this morning, a virus expert was talking about anticipating in the U.S., he's the doctor to the Congress, was actually said that he expects that 70% of the people in the U.S. will be exposed to the coronavirus. Well, they're also expecting that level of exposure on a global basis. This is definitely enough to topple the system. And also, you know, who are you going to point your finger at for who created this? Because it's a virus, right? Now, how they handle it is a different story, but cases in the U.S. have now exceeded 1,000, and we have a number of places in this country that are now starting to lock down. Well, I'll show you that in just a second. So the, this data is from this morning where there's over 121,000 cases globally of the coronavirus. 120 countries are now have cases in them. The first time I pulled the graph from this or the information from this particular site, and of course the links are on our blog, there were only th either 31 or 33 countries. And that was what, a week or two ago? Maybe two weeks, maybe max? Now it's 120. There's 195 countries in this world. We'll see how, you can see how rapidly it is expanding. And those in the health industry globally were getting together to meet. But 
the coronavirus conference where they were going to meet to determine how they can handle this on a global basis got canceled because of coronavirus. Right, people are staying home more narrow. They're not going out. They're not living their day-to-day -day lives. And so what that really means is that the global economy is more than just slowing. And we were already entering that slowdown before this outbreak. So we're going to see what everybody's going to do. But the only thing that they can do at this point, particularly central banks, is print money. And that is not going to make you leave your house and go shopping because interest rates are low or even if they give you money, which is probably coming. We're probably going to see some universal basic income. Now, President Trump is trying to get past some of the um, changes that they feel will help buffer the impact of the coronavirus on the economy. And one of them is, and this is not done yet, but a 0% payroll tax for the rest of the year. So, of course, now we have to hope that these people can maintain their jobs because with business falling off, a lot of small and medium-sized companies, which are the ones, that, that's the engine of the economy. It's not the big corporations in the U.S. It's the small and medium mom and pops. The smaller operations are really who, get, who um, supports the employment of most of the people in the economy. And since they're typically running pretty tight, you know, we've got some problems and there are already layoffs that we're seeing and that should be that should be growing. So we are probably going to see an expanded uh, unemployment going into effect like during the 2008 crisis. I'm sure we'll see that. We'll see we'll see what we're going to see. Zero payroll tax, etc. But Italy has shut down the country. Now, a number of years ago, Megan and I went to Italy and we had the, the best guide in the whole world. And um, could you please scroll that? Thank you. And so we reached out to him and I, I'm not going to use his name because he didn't give me permission to, but we love him. And on 227, we reached out and said, how are you doing? Because he operates out of Florence. And he said, in Florence and Mangello, where I spend most of my time now, it's no trace of ec ec epidemic disease around us. My feeling is that something a little stronger than a flu has been overestimated and made appear a pandemic. For which reason, I can't say. And that was on February 27th. We reached out to him this morning and he says, in few days, everything changed and now Italy is locked out. Around me still, I don't see anyone sick, but it might change quickly. No peoples around or very few. We just stay home now. Very sad. And then also he said, just make, let's see, just make people sensitive that it's a serious disease since spread out since it spreads out fast and the healthcare system could be easily overwhelmed in case many people need intensive therapy. OMS just okay, so that's the World Trade Organization, but this might be someone in some agency in Italy just declared a, a pandemic disease. No work for most of the people or here. The most are flat down. In other words, laying down. No panic, though. Just few people around. Most stay home. It's time to reflect. Okay? So this is boots on the street in Italy of what's going on. So they're trying to help these people because, frankly, this person, his job is as a tour guide. And he's not doing any tours right now. So all mortgages will be suspended as well as repayments of small loans and revolving credit lines that companies use to have enough liquidity. Now, what does it mean that the mortgages are suspended? Does this mean they go away? No, no, no. What they're talking about is temporarily suspending the requirement to pay those mortgages. 
And they have to do something like that because otherwise the banks would be foreclosing on all of those mortgages for those people that can't pay them. And as smaller businesses are impacted, they're not going to have the money to pay them. So they're trying to uh, put in a little stopgap until things calm down and people start moving again. But here's the problem with that. Is this, and this is a really good question, is this going to, depending upon how long this lasts and the new habits that people create around it, is this going to impact the tourism industry, the, you know, stadiums are empty, et cetera? Because tourism, and I'll do something on this, is a full 10% or so plus of the global economy. That's a pretty big chunk. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not going on a cruise, you know, and I've changed my plans based on it. And how is the Italian market responding? Well, there you go. Of course, it's, gonna, it's going to drop, uh, but they're also hiking spending to tackle the coronavirus. Okay, well, if it's going into the healthcare system, if it's going into the pockets of the individuals, then that may indeed help. If not, if it's going into the hands of the banks, not sure how much that's going to help. Time will tell and we'll pay attention to it. But they're also changing a lot of the rules and the regulations, which has been happening slowly since 2008. And they're starting to do the same kind of reckless, speculative behavior that led to the crisis first in 2008 in this country, and then in 2014 um, with the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. So they're creating that righteous loop where the government creates money, gives it to the banks, so that the banks can buy the debt of the government. That nice little loop that it didn't work real well in the sovereign debt crisis, I'm pretty sure it's not going to work real well this time either. But additionally, okay, here we go. What are the central banks doing? They're cutting rates. Are you suddenly going to run out and borrow money if, you, if you're losing your job or if you're uncertain about your future? Of course you're not. But they don't have any more tools, and they certainly don't have the tools that they need to fight this. Here, the U.S., in addition to the zero uh, income tax, the Treasury is considering extending the April 15th tax deadline. So globally, they're talking about that a lot to postpone that, that deadline to pay your taxes for corporations. So, But if you spend that money, it's not like you don't have to pay the taxes. They're not forgiving the taxes. They're just postponing when you have to file or make that payment. Now, if you get a paycheck, that's taken out every week or however often you, you get that. But even in New Rochelle, New York, it's on lockdown. So it's starting to get very serious in the U.S. as well. You know, it isn't that is there, this is here. My other daughter was telling me about friends that had a planned trip to Italy and she spoke to him on Facebook and said, you know, well, are you going to cancel your plans? And they're like, no. So they may well be in Italy locked down right now. I don't know the outcome, but they kind of thought that they knew better and they may be stuck there. If they're not stuck there and they came back here, I hope I'm never exposed to them. Because, you know, it's not just about you or you. It's about all of us in the community and it's about all of us being conscious about it. I want you to really keep in mind, though, the setup for what's coming. Because right now, um, and I'll find out after afterwards, uh, hopefully, what the outcome was, but the president was meeting with a lot of the bank CEOs and talking about making sure that you can lend more money, so enable these small and medium-sized businesses to borrow more. Well, they already have unpayable debt. But, you know, and all of the mountain of debt that was grown, it didn't stop us from running into a global slowdown. That didn't just happen with the coronavirus. That's been coming since 2008. 
All that debt did was make a lot more unpayable debt. And the government could ask regulators, I love this one, to reduce the amount of capital that banks have to hold against loans. So we're talking about leverage. So what I hear when I'm listening is how well capitalized those banks are now and how awesome and how much stronger they are. Well, oh, really? Because what happened in September with the repo markets tells me just the opposite. But all of that money that's now held in reserves, they're going to release that, making them that much more dangerous and risky. But that's not all. I love this. I'm telling you. They're going to relax the living will rules on cash held at the Fed. So, you know, if something goes wrong, remember, they pay out. When they pass those stress tests, which are not this stressful, by the way, but when they pass those stress tests, they get to distribute to their shareholders. When that money leaves the bank, when their profits, that money leaves the bank and goes to their shareholders, they can't call up and say, hey, send that money back. It doesn't work. So that means they have even less in reserve in a time of crisis. Accelerate proposed changes to the Volcker rule, the definition of proprietary trading. Now, I've shown you many times, but you can Google this for yourself. The OCC, which is the office of uh, the, um, oh my gosh, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. They do a quarterly report on derivatives in FDIC insured banks. And we already saw, because I just showed you that graph, I don't know, a week or so ago, how it had grown higher since 2008. That's all proprietary trading. That's all prop trading. So they weren't really paying attention to the, to the Volcker, Volcker rule. But what that also means, it's all flipping speculation. And with the level of volatility in these markets, you absolutely positively know that there are all sorts of things that are going on that we can't see yet. And by the time we do see them, well, it'll probably look like Deutsche Bank, which I'm going to show you in just a second. But they're also going to make it easier to offer and trade credit default swaps. Well, guess what froze in 2008? CDSs, credit default swaps. And on that OCC report, and I'll, I'll, I'll pull up the most current one again. I just did this, though. You can, you can look it up. Or, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll add this. But uh, in the most current one, they were so proud to point out where that was in 2008 but that is risky, risky, risky. And that's basically what you need to know, that whatever wealth you're holding in the banking system is at risk of bail-in. Will they honor the, the deposit insurance scheme? Well, they don't have enough in the DIF fund and that deposit insurance fund to pay off if a lot of banks go under at once. And this is, this is really, we are inside of a massive accident that is already happening. And I'm going to bring your attention to Deutsche Bank because they reported massive losses for 2019. But somehow, magically, I don't know, in anticipation of this, who knows? And look at this big, huge gap in their stock chart. Wow, that Deutsche Bank went from seven to over 11 bucks. But it's back down to mm, 696 right now. So it's kissing where it was back in August. This is systemically the most important bank on the planet. It is tied to every other bank. So they're all in trouble. This one, is, is this one in the most trouble? I don't know. But it is a domino effect. And clearly, if, if they hadn't gotten this ready and pushed that price up to 11, I mean, I don't even know what to say about it, to be perfectly honest with you. But they would probably be gone. I mean, there's only so far to zero that a stock can go. This looks 
horrendous. The whole, all of the markets look horrendous. Now, if you listen to the talking heads on TV, while some are saying be cautious and some are actually saying don't buy the dip, we have been trained to buy the dip because the central banks have their back. And so the question that they're asking on CNBC is, well, where's the bottom? Well, where's the bottom? Well, Robert Schiller is saying this is a dangerous time. Let me show you why he's saying that. This is the Schiller price earnings ratio. I've shown you this before. The average is, or the median rather, is 15.76 times earnings times past earnings, right? At the moment, we are actually well above that at 27.36. So just to get to fair value, you're looking at roughly about what? 40, 45% lower from here. Just to get to average, but here's the problem. Moving forward, who knows what those earnings are going to be? Nobody does because we don't know what the full impact of an economic stop, which is real close to where we are. I mean, it's happening in Italy, as you just heard, and in China. So China's slowly coming back on. But again, we don't know what those earnings are going to be. And even moving into that, you can see, and we've talked about this, that the earnings were already declining. So what is the real value or a fair value on stocks? A lot, lot lower. If, you're, if you are listening to your stockbroker who is telling you, oh, you know, don't worry about it. The markets always come back. Now look, we know that the central banks are printing. We 100% know that. And so if we see this, if they flood the system with enough cash, it must go someplace. But it is the liquidity issue, which I will be talking about again, and your ability to actually liquidate that is in question. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Because Wall Street's going, well, where's the bottom? The markets are extremely oversold. Yes, I'll give them that. You don't drop 18%, you know, that quickly without it being oversold. You know, I've said nothing goes straight down, nothing goes straight up. You must have bouncing along the way. But you cannot use what they've used in the past 10 years to determine whether or not these markets are in a bottom because all of that, that Fed and central bank money printing means that there was no good price discovery anyway. But yet you're going to hear these talking heads on TV say, well, if you liked it two weeks ago at its high, you certainly must like it here, 15% below that except that it's still overvalued. So no, I don't like it there. I don't like it here. We'll see. I'll let you know when I like it. But what I'm going to be looking for is to let those zombie companies, those over-indebted companies get washed out. Then I'm going to be looking for that cup formation, which is a strong accumulation pattern versus the V, which is manipulation. Accumulation. That is when I will look to move into this. Now, this is the VIX, which is the volatility index. I want to point out to you that the only time that it was ever higher now was back in 2008 and 2009. And what this is telling us, this is the longer term chart, this is a shorter one so that you can see that when I pulled that this morning, 1128, it was, it was 53.48. And what that means is that the market is completely unsure of what those stock earnings are going to be. So no, we are not near a bottom. Now I'm not saying that you're gonna get, not get these huge, 
you know, thousand points or even 2000 point swings. But what that's really showing you is how insane this market is. If you're holding your wealth there, your stockbroker will say don't. But ask yourself if you've ever seen a market like this. Because I've been in these markets for a very long time and I've never seen this kind of behavior. Never. Not in 2000, not in 87, not even in 2008. The system is dead and the central banks are out of ammunition. And all of the leverage that have been built into the system, which is entities borrowing money to buy stocks. That's that margin call thing that we talked about. In China, they're huge on leverage upon leverage upon leverage. And that's what derivatives are all about, leverage upon leverage upon leverage. So for example, and Megan, can you run this number for me? Mm -hmm. 500 times 1643. I think that's where it was at least earlier spot gold when I looked at it. Okay. So $150 controls $821,500 worth of physical gold. That's leverage, 150 bucks to control that. And that is unwinding now. It is unwinding now, okay? Now, I want to point out to you because in this country, this is the margin debt, so that's that leverage, borrowing to buy stocks, and this graph goes back to 95. And the red line is the margin debt, and the blue line is the S&P 500. And you might recall, I think it was either last week or two weeks ago, but recently I showed you a pattern shift where the market had gone above the margin. And I said that is very dangerous and so here we go. And what you're looking at, the reason why you see the margin debt decline when the stock markets decline is because the value of what they're holding is declining and you get a margin call. You got to come up with money when the markets decline. So this was a huge, I showed you when it first happened, and then it got like huge. It was way, the markets were so far stretched that, I mean, even though this is all shocking, nobody should really be surprised. I got to tell you, the most expensive markets ever, nobody should have been very surprised. But the leverage here and in the bond market, which is what I was really going to talk about today, but I'll, I'll see if I can pull something together for tomorrow for that. It is unwinding now. How much can the central banks prop in to keep this going? Mm -hmm. Is it going to work again? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But if you see spot gold fall a little bit, take advantage of it. It doesn't mean that this has gone down in value. And don't buy those things like GLD or Wall Street products because what you're buying is dollars. This is real money. This is global money. This runs no counterparty risk. And I'd like to point out to you the long-term chart on spot gold. Now, remember, this is a manipulated market. They say, well, this is how much it is. But once they took us off the gold standard and allowed us to own gold again, well, heck, spot gold, gold was at 35, uh, uh, manipulated, but 35 bucks an ounce. Now it's at 1643 or wherever it happens to be at the moment. And that is still severely undervalued and a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift. Take advantage of it. If you've already built your position, but you're still sitting with dollar denominated assets, why? I mean, you got to do what you're comfortable with, but ask yourself, why? Why am I holding these? Because to me, it makes no sense. But you can see how close we are to concluding the cup formation. There is no resistance to spot gold until we get to 1800. That's minimal. I mean, that's like right here. Well, right here. And then 1900. And we're off to the races because... And you can see it here because here's another cup, right? When you technically go above that cup, 
It's like handing, putting your hand on a spring. When you remove your hand, whatever that acid or instrument is, shoots in a direction. In the case of a cup conclusion, it shoots up. So I can't tell you exactly how high spot's going to go. I can tell you that when the central banks are ready to reset the financial system. And clearly, what's happening right now justifies a, a system-wide reset. And because it can appear to be not created by central banks, well, I'll show you what they're hoping, but... You know, they're talking, again, about how this is going to look different on the other side of this mess. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But before I do, I want to show you and I want to talk about that illusion of liquidity, that illusion of ownership. Now, you've probably heard about Robinhood, which is a tech startup that was launched in 2013. And, you know, and they charging zero fees and they really appeal to like the millennials etc except that they've had three outages inside of this massive stock move that has been going on now for what a week and a half or two weeks okay so you know you think you want to place a position sell something buy something eh, eh, eh. You're not going to do it because it's out. So that kind of, it, it, it's not available for you to do. Okay, I'll hold that thought for just one more second. But if you think that it's just Robin Hood, uh, no. Fidelity, Schwab, and TD Ameritrade also had technical glitches on their websites. Let's see what the let's see what investors say about that. Here we go again, again. Some volatility and fidelity can't keep their online trading working. My accounts all show zero balance. Now, you tell me who you're going to complain to. Try and get a hold of fidelity. At Vanguard. Seriously? And what does Vanguard say? Our website is temporarily unavailable. We sincerely apologize for the inconvenience and appreciate, I'm sure that said, patience. Well, how patient are you when these markets are, are moving at a thousand points at a clip? Probably not all that patient. But what are you going to do about it? There's not a darn thing you can do. Nothing. And over at TD Ameritrade, think or swim, Ameritrade again issues all morning. Charts lagging, prices lagging, orders not filled, filled late, trading in the dark. Does this make you feel warm and fuzzy? Because guess what doesn't happen with gold? That does not happen with gold because you hold it and you own it outright. It is not subject to any electronic glitches that remove your access from it. Investment firms face customer fury over tech glitches. I mean, come on, people. How, if this happened to any of you guys, could you share that? Because how would you feel? How would you feel if you go to the bank and the doors are locked and you have no access to your money? If you call your stockbroker and he's under the desk because he's too afraid to talk to you because he really doesn't know what to say and he totally doesn't want you to sell because he's in meetings right now and they're saying, Tell them it's going to be okay. Tell them that the central banks have their back. Tell them not to sell. The markets always go up. Yeah, they go up until they don't. And who's going to be eating it on the chin? Those people that left that money in there. Because we know the insiders have been getting out. Jeff Be Bezos sold how many billions of dollars worth of his stock last quarter? I didn't even get a chance to talk about that. But I've shown you over and over again, of course... Over at the NASDAQ, they changed the site, so you can't really see so clearly and easily what the insiders are doing anymore. But they're getting out. They knew this was coming. They knew these markets were severely overvalued. They just want you to stay in them. I think this is disgusting. I think this is completely disgusting. Now, 
This Allen Blinder is a, an ex-Fed chief. So I'm thinking he probably is pretty familiar with the tools at their disposal. And what does he say? The Fed is powerless to do anything about this other than providing liquidity where needed and allowing banks to forbear on loans and arrears. In other words, to forgive them or to postpone them like we saw in Italy. That debt does not disappear. Now, maybe they allow you to take on even more debt, but sooner or later, with debt, you either have to pay it, you have to roll it over, or you have to default on it. And those levels of default lie in our future. Even if they get the banks to forbear, forbear the loans that are in arrears. And if the economy stops, how are people going to make money? How are they going to pay these loans? Have to show you what this, and we'll be watching this chart a whole lot more, but this, you've seen it before from Yardeni Research. I mean, I love their graphs and their charts. So in this one, the S&P is red, and the central bank balance sheets, the global central bank balance sheets, the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, anyway, are in blue. And you can see that typically they inject the money and that pushes the market up. And when the market attempted to stall, what did they do? They pushed in more and more money. Well, you can see how the markets diverged from what the central banks were doing and look at them plummet. So what my bet is, and actually what they're telling us anyway, is that we they're going to pump a whole lot more money and you'll see that go straight up. Do not be fooled. It does not mean that they have solved anything. You are at risk of anything that you hold in the system. It is at risk. I don't really know how more clearly to say that. I don't own any, period. I don't. Do I have some cash? Of course I have to because that is still our tool of barter, but by a wide, wide margin, I hold my money in physical gold. Different kinds, right? Because it depends on what I need to accomplish. For example, I have a business. I have staff that are counting on me to be able to pay their salaries. So I have a certain level of cash, then I have a certain level of just basic gold. It's still in collectible form because I don't see any way around an overt confiscation. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. At least if I'm holding this, doesn't matter what, one way or the other because it's so cheap. But I'm going to be able to sustain for a long period of time because I have real savings. That's what gold and silver are. Real savings. Because there is demand across the entire global economy. Right now that demand, in, in industry anyway, may be less. But because there, you're getting demand from so many different places, whether it's the financial system or manufacturing or medicine, Medicine might be a good place for them to be looking at the silver and the gold because actually they are really highly antibacterial anti and even antifungal because I've been taking colloidal silver in my juice every morning as a preventative measure, actually. But what I'd like to point out here is the only tool they have are rate cuts and everybody's pretty much near zero. So there have been 800 rate cuts since 2008. 800 rate cuts. Now, let's think about that. Since we were already heading into a global slowdown, did all of that new money, that debt, all those rate cuts, did they really help? The answer is no. The answer is no. Are they going to help this time? Nah, I'm thinking no. And Christine Lagarde, who's now head of the ECB, well, 2008 style crisis, unless Europe acts, and what can they do? What Italy did, lock it down? We'll see. This is getting really, really scary. 
and even good old Deutsche Bank's got a way in. And here's the piece that I want you to understand what I'm going to show you. Policy failure is here, okay? Lack of trust that the central banks have the answer for this one. That's it. We've been talking about that confidence all along. Now they're making it even, I mean, and I've been showing you as that's been coming out, but now it's coming out a lot faster. Jim Cramer, not my favorite, but Jim Cramer says the coronavirus has brought about the end of monetary policy's effectiveness. In other words, more debt, more debt, more debt. And El Arian, who works for PINCO, it's going to be messy because we've basically lost all of our anchors. We lost the economic anchor with the coronavirus. Businesses are shut down. We've lost the policy anchor with people losing confidence in the Fed's ability to turn things around. Do you see this? And over the weekend, we lost a market anchor with OPEC failing to get a production cut deal. We lost all of our anchors. We are in uncharted territory. You know, somebody asked me, do I think this is it? Okay. Yes, I think this is it. Now, I don't think that everything, they're not done yet, okay? So, so what I mean, okay, what I mean by this is it is I don't see a way out of this mess. It's very obvious. So we are now in crisis. And they're still going to try the only tools that they have, though it'll be interesting to see what experiments they're going to come up with. Modern money theory, I'm certain of it. Universal ba basic, where they just print. They just print and print and print and print and print to pay for everything and everything and everything. Except that even if they did social programs now, you know, building roads and the infrastructure in the U.S. has, has been in shambles. They've been talking about funding it for a long time. Except that if 70% of the population comes down with coronavirus, who's going to be working there? So that's the problem. That's why this won't work anymore, because it is a demand issue. And if people are staying home, it's a different level of demand. But central bankers have been nervous about this for a while. So they're coming out more than 10 years after the crisis. Central banks are hoping the public will give them a new direction. Is that really a warning about the reset? Is this really just a cover for them to say, well, see, we didn't do this, but we're going to do this now because this will save us. When people are hungry and hopeless, when they are scared enough, maybe they'll believe the central bank. This will save us. Just like in Venezuela, they lop off those zeros. In Zimbabwe, they lop off those zeros. Did it save them? No. So I am, I am certain, I mean, I can't guarantee anything, but I do not see a way out of this. And I think that what they're going to do is print us into that hyperinflation. They have lost control. They have lost control. So I'll take a couple of questions. Um, I'll take a couple of questions, but what do I think about a Sprott Gold and Silver Trust for 401k allocated gold? Well, it's physical and it's in Canada, so, but it's not in your possession and that's really where I have a challenge. Now, if you can't liquidate a 401k, uh, unless, and, and Canada has no gold in their reserves, none. <sighs> if you don't hold it, you don't own it. it. It's a better option than GLD or something like that. But if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And if you live here and it's there and you need it, how are you going to get it? <sighs> That's a, 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 you know, it's a tough one. These, these are not normal times. Um, and Ron asks, there will have to be signs of crashing U.S. dollar, i.e. other fiat currency, 
we'll have to crash first. Why wouldn't we wait for that warning sign? Actually, Ron, I'm really glad that you asked me that because I didn't have room to put that in here. But um, will we'll, Jacqueline, when you put on the thing, I already pulled a lot of the data. The currency markets are in huge turmoil. So I will do something on that. Maybe I'll throw that together tonight. I don't know. Do you guys want me to talk about debt tomorrow or do you want me to talk about the currency markets? If you let me know, you know, I'm going to talk about both of them. I'm just not able to do both of them at once. And how is helicopter fiat money not destructive to the workforce? Well, the way the reason why helicopter money is destructive, period, is because the cheaper and easier it is to get something, the less value that it has. And as it is, officially, we only have three cents, a little bit more than three cents out of the original dollars worth of purchasing power. So the helicopter money or the universal basic income, those kind of things are destructive to your purchasing power and therefore your standard of living because the system is, is designed so that the average person never keeps up with inflation, ever. And I can take one more and then I'm sorry that that's it. Um, do you think banks will accept gold straight up after the reset or will you have to use a third party to convert it? Well, I think part of it may depend, and I don't know exactly, so you can't hold me to this. However, uh, the banks will be tasked with gathering, most likely, if they do an overt confiscation, the banks will be tasked with accumulating as much gold as they can. So it is possible that the banks will indeed accept gold straight up after, well, during the reset, probably, so we'll just have to see. But if you need to use a third party to convert it, that's fine too because there's lots of us out there. And some of these transactions, I mean, this goes to the strategy. And we do have a 12-piece strategy, which I am going to talk to you more about probably next week or soon because you need to know. But it's all outlined. All of our consultants here have been trained in it. It is a plan and it is based upon your personal needs, goals, and what you have available. So, you know, call us. We're, we're all pedaling as fast as we can, but we are here for you. And if you don't know our number, 888-696-4653, call us. It's, the plan is going to evolve physical gold and silver because this is the only undervalued asset that there is, and particularly that is in a long-term positive trend. So uh, yesterday I did a podcast with Miles at Be Unconstrained. It was excellent. It was like a 101. So we're going to be, he's going to be releasing it on his podcast probably on Sunday. But we're going to be really, he gave us permission to release this video. Um, it may be today or maybe tomorrow, but we're going to get that, that out to you because it doesn't really have to be edited. I think they just want to put some music in the front. It was a great, he did a great job, Miles did. So if for some reason you prefer it as a podcast, you can go to his channel. Do we have those links? We'll, we'll put those links on. So whichever way you want to, whichever way you want to listen to it, watch it. Next week, I'm going to be with Lior Gans. I haven't seen him in a while. I'm dying to know where he is in this world so that we can talk about what's going on wherever he is. Uh, and he's over at Future Money Trends. And just keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. Physical, not paper, not promises certainly not stocks. So until tomorrow, please, 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 and I, I mean this seriously, be safe out there. Bye-bye.